Good morning and welcome to woo. Welcome to the HWWC Healing Waters Worship Center. It's good to be here. I'm glad to see. I'm glad you made it out to the house of the Lord today. Um, let me tell you a story. This won't take long, and and I got all the time in the world, right? So, um, a couple weeks ago, um, we were meeting some friends at a restaurant, and. These guys don't live around here, so, you know, I, like, give them directions, told them where it was, but I'm sitting there, and I'm antsy, and Janet is just yelling at me, wondering why, uh, wondering why I, I won't sit still. She says, you're like a little kid, and, and, and I was, you know, I was, I had some anxiety. I, I, I had some, uh, a lot of feelings there. I was wondering if I gave them the right directions, because sometimes I make mistakes, right? Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, you know, and then I was wanting to see him. He's my best friend, and, you know, he's in it, in town, not very, here very often. But I had this, you know, this anxiety, this anxiousness there. And I was, th I was thinking about this in first service. Why don't I ever feel that way on the way to the house of the Lord, that anxiety, that, that, uh, that desire to meet with, that uh, anticipation of that event? And, and I think that's something that we all should have is that anticipation of meeting with God here in his house. Amen? And my phone's gone to sleep. Oh, man. And I will forget what to say here. Because I did want to share some other things with you about what's coming up this week. Next Sunday, there's a very important meeting. It's a partner's meeting. It's uh, here at 2.30. So please put that on your calendar. You'll have time to go get something to eat and come back and and hang out with us and <clears throat> and talk about our church. Some other things coming up next weekend, starting Friday night, right, 7 p.m. I get that right, not a.m., p.m. We're having Lighthouse Student Ministries Theater here. Um, and then March 5th, Saturday morning, 9 a.m., is men's breakfast. And then after, immediately after service next week, um, is Lighthouse Student Ministries Bake Sale. So please don't miss those items. They are coming up. And then um, two weeks from now, March 13th, which happens to be Spring Ahead Day, just a reminder, something for you to think about, is uh, after service, it's something we haven't done before. It's uh, Lighthouse Student Ministries Cornhole Tournament. So uh, all you cornholers, get ready, start pack practicing, set that board up in the backyard, and... Uh, Get your aim together. Amen? Amen? All right. So if you guys, uh, I've done my part. It's your part now. So if you guys will stand up with me, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to welcome him into this house, and we're going to tell him that we're here to meet with him. Amen? Heavenly Father, dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. God, we anticipate meeting with you. God, we come with that soul purpose in mind to meet with you. God, we're asking for you to meet with us now. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. He is worthy of the honor and the praise, so let's sing to him this morning. Here we go.
good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee. Anybody been following the news lately? Doesn't seem like perfect peace out there. And it's hard, hard to stay focused on God sometimes when everything else is going crazy in the world. But Paul said to the Colossians in uh, Colossians 3, 15 through 17, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him or through him to God the Father. So we're going to come together in corporate cry out this morning in the name of Jesus with thankfulness in our hearts for what God is doing with us, even when it seems like everything else is falling apart. Let's uh, continue to remember Phil Herndon and um, Peggy Musa as their recovery continues. And um, is anybody else here have an unspoken request, something that you didn't fill out or anything that's going on in your life amen it's there's so much and there's so much weighing down on us every day and the world seems so crazy that it we need God every step of the way don't we all right let's pray father we come to you this morning and we thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives we thank you for everything that you're doing in our hearts and we thank you that your peace passes all understanding we thank you for your love and your mercy and we ask you to please Help us to, to walk in wisdom and walk in love and walk in kindness, even when everything else is crazy. We ask you to please be with Phil Herndon. Continue to move in that situation as he, as he works to recover. And, and with Peggy Musa, as she's working to recover, Father. We ask you to please uh, let your grace and favor be with there as, the, as they go through therapy, any therapy that they have to go through, Lord. And we, we thank you that you are with us every step of the way. We worship you above all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Continue to worship. Morning.
quick show anybody felt like you were sinking before. Yeah. And what do we do when we feel like we're sinking? We panic. We panic. Any panickers in the house? When you feel like you're sinking, nothing seems to make sense. Even what you thought you knew, you really don't know. Our perception gets wrong when we're sinking. We overreact when we're sinking. You ever been there? So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take a moment right where you are, right where you're standing is your own little altar. And I want us to ask the Lord to help us. Maybe you're in here today and you're like, I came in, I put my big boy, big girl face on and I came in, woohoo, but I'm sinking. Maybe, maybe you're sinking right now. But here's what we know. God is a very present help Amen. in time of need. And sometimes when he picks you up, it doesn't mean the storm stopped. It means he just kept you from drowning, but you still got to weather the storm. And so I want us to pray. I want you to pray right, right where you are that God will help you with whatever it is that you're juggling. Okay? Everybody got the assignment. <laughs> so, Father, in this moment, Lord, whether we're in this place or maybe watching on live stream or maybe on a replay later, we do find ourselves in this life sinking. Cares of life, you warned us about them. That the cares of life would literally come in and they would choke the things that are connected to you and they would choke our spirit. And if we're honest, there are moments when those stressors distort our focus, our vision, it causes things to appear even the way they're not. There are times that we overreact. There are moments that we retreat. There are moments that we just absolutely are baffled. But our prayer today, right where we are, is that you would reach down to us. We're reaching towards you. We're looking to you, the author and finisher of our faith, and we're saying to you, help. It's for some, it's the best we got, just help where we are, and we're reaching to you. And Some need peace today. Some need provision that only you can provide, and I just pray, Lord, we pray that you'd give them a moment to catch their breath. For every person that's in their own struggle right now, standing in this room or watching, would you give them peace and clarity of mind and a moment to catch their breath. You lead us and you keep us. And you are able to still do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And we'll give you praise and we'll give you honor and we'll give you the glory for what you accomplish in our lives as we submit all things to you. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Father, I know it was mentioned earlier, but we also in this moment stand again in the gap for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine that you would touch them. You administer to them, Lord, even in between services. I've seen pictures of churches that have been absolutely destroyed. Would you touch congregations and men and women of God in those various places and protect them? And even in the moments of disorder and chaos, would you use your people as a beacon of hope, help, and healing? We lift them to you, Lord. Do a work there that only you can do. And we'll give you thanks because of who you are. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's good to be together in the house of the Lord today. We worship the Lord in a variety of ways. We lift our voice in song. And sometimes I know you know the song, and sometimes you don't know the song. And sometimes you do the watermelon. You know what watermelon is, right? I don't know, so I just sing. Wah, 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 wah. The Bible says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. I'm glad that we're able to do that. But we, we do worship the Lord in song. We worship Him through His Word. We worship Him. We believe in giving. We know the Bible says that the tithe belongs to the Lord and we give all. It's a part of our DNA. In case you're wondering what we do, it's a part of our DNA. And you'll see folks in just a moment kind of move around the house because we also believe another part of our DNA in worship is this aspect of greeting. How many of you like being encouraged? Okay, here's my problem with that response. Not everybody raised their hand. So I'm going to ask this one just for the sake of figuring this out because I like data. Uh, is anybody enjoy being discouraged? I'm going to shut my eyes. Hopefully nobody raised their hand and be like, yeah, I really enjoy the, the uh, discouragement. We don't enjoy discouragement. So 
part of our worship is also the ability we have to encourage one another. So as we enter this time, I pray that you can find somebody in the house, either from afar waving at them or greeting somebody and being an encouragement in the house as it is all worship to God. So Father, thank you for this moment that we have to worship you in giving and greeting. Let the connection of the body be an encouragement to one to another and thus an expression of worship to you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to bring to you your tithe, our offering, and we do so according to your word. And this is worship to you. And we bless you now in it and through it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. connecting with one another in uh, encouragement and in greeting together. It is so vitally important. We're delighted to be together in the house of the Lord today. I know that, uh, yeah, good stuff. Uh, I know that you are fully aware of all the current events, and I just want to encourage you to be praying for the folks in Ukraine. And here's my invitation to you. At 11 o'clock tomorrow, uh, it is our goal to join with churches all over the United States and even around the world. 11 o'clock, our time here, uh, I'm asking you to set a reminder at 11 o'clock tomorrow to lift your voice and pray for the people in Ukraine and ask God several things. One, to interrupt the cycle of things that are going on there. The Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He can still change people's hearts. The third thing is that God will touch the people of God there. I saw pictures just in between services today of churches that have been obliterated by the violence already. And so I'm asking, we are asking, join us at 11 o'clock. We'll send a reminder out as well. 11 o'clock, our time tomorrow that we will pray specifically standing in the gap for the people of God and really for that entire nation there. One of the things that uh, I valued this month is being able to keep things in front of us for understanding purposes. And one of the things that has been amazing to see God do over the years in the midst of all the craziness, how many know God is able to preserve people and even in the midst of chaos and craziness, he's able to save people and preserve people even when other people are making dumb decisions. Now, 
So I want to draw your attention to the screen again today, and I just want you to see with me kind of the history of the black church and how God did some amazing things throughout history and what God did in touching people's lives from the very beginning. Take a look. The black church in America begins on an East Coast ocean dock. Dark skin derided. A daddy and his children divided. Right there on an auction block. The black church in America begins in a field beneath the sun. Shackled sons and daughters hearing about the father's love. The black church in America forced to toil and till the sod while the same ones holding the whip told them to put your faith in God. And by grace alone, they did. breathed it in a song, and in the melody of the Negro spirituals, they found the faith to carry on, to flourish, to fight, to exist, to exhort, the faith to follow Harriet running rivers to the north, a faith that echoed Augustine and those great African theologians from a thousand years before on the other side of the ocean. The faith to be free in Christ, even when your country denies you liberty. The faith to never give up, never give up your human dignity. It was the faith for Frederick Douglass to hop a train and escape to freedom, and then proclaim the will of God in the presence of President Lincoln. It was a faith to war and wait for emancipation proclamation. A faith that made Juneteenth the most holy celebration. It's the faith to begin again with Jesus at the center. It's a faith to start the black church because no other church would even let you enter. It's the preaching of Lemuel Haynes, a first of its kind in this nation. It's Francis Grimke and Gardner Taylor resisting segregation. It's a praise song from brown-bodied lips, both layman and ecclesiastic. It's the anthem of all the mamas when Emmett Till was in the casket. It's Mahalia Jackson singing, precious Lord, take my hand. It's blood on Edmund Pettus Bridge and all across this land. It's a faith that God can surely redeem what's happened in the past. It's the faith of Martin Luther King. I'm free. I'm free at last. The faith of C.T. Vivian, Joseph Lowry, Rosa Parks, those beautiful black lights of Jesus shining in the dark. To God be the glory, the sole future of our faith the foundation of Tony Evans and the fire of T.D. Jakes, the song of the Clark sisters, Andre Crouch, Donnie McClurkin, B.B., C.C., Yolanda, and G.P., are you with me, Kirk Franklin? It's the legacies of John M. Perkins, Crawford Loritz, and the soul's desire of Dr. Darius Daniels, Lisa Fields, Priscilla Shire. It's a history of resilience, revival, reconciliation. It's the Holy Spirit raising up a future generation who will carry this thing. The church of Jesus is stronger, more beautiful, bold, and diverse because of the lasting, living legacy, the faith of the black church. Amen. And the reason I have taken time this month to show you important glimpses is twofold. One, so that you know, and two, that we as a people of God realize that we are now one church and we have to work very hard so that we don't repeat the ills 
of generations gone by. And so, um, yeah, so God is good, and I'm grateful that he, in the midst of crazy tragedy and foolishness of men, saved souls of men and women and brought them to know him. I'm grateful for that. Today I want to continue to talk, yeah, today I want to continue to talk to you in our series. It's called, It's On You. Say that with me. It's on you. And I know you're thinking, it's on my neighbor. No, I'm, I'm talking to you. It's on you. And today I want to talk to you about just a simple thought, you've lost it. And some of you say, yeah, I lost it a long time ago. And maybe you're thinking about your neighbor, they lost it. A long time ago, but it's probably not going to be what you think today. We're going to be going to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16 as we begin our journey today. And the thing that I'm talking to you today that we've lost, it's not our minds, although we could argue the point. It's not our, our framework, although we could argue that point. It's literally the passion and lens for the lost and the hurting of our society. We, have, we are no longer... Uh, moved by the lost and the hurting, and we're going to use this as our text this morning to begin a journey. First Samuel 16, beginning in verse 1, now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, for I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons." And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. If you drop down to verse 4, Samuel, the Bible says, so Samuel did what the Lord said, and he went to Bethlehem. Father, would you bless and anoint your word today? Would you, by your Holy Spirit, convict our hearts with the very passion and for the very passion that your people over time have lost? Would you strengthen us today? Would you let the... Uh, fog be lifted from our souls, that we would see the harvest fields again and realize that you have called us to reach the lost, to do what Jesus came to do as our mandate or must and should be our mandate and help us. For far too long we have not become all that you've called us to be and been searching for things that you never called us to seek and we'll bless you today for your glory. In Jesus' name and all God's people said... It's amazing to me how often days, in today's time, the church speaks churchy language. You ever been, been around somebody that speaks churchy? Churchy, churchy, churchy. They, they, uh, some people would say of that that they're too heavily minded to be any earthly good. And so I've, I, I've got a video that I want you to see that kind of depicts this. It'll make you laugh. Ho my goal is hopefully it'll make you think about it. Because God wants us to be better at being salt and light in the earth, but oftentimes we become like what you're going to see, and what it does to the lost, it, it confuses them and keeps them blind so that they can't see as well. Take a look at this video, and then we're going to come back and dive into this passage together. And then the outback. <laughs> I, I can't wait. Oh, man, that's so exciting. I'm so yeah. jealous. Hi. Hey, hey, Esther. Oh my gosh. Uh, Esther, this is Alyssa. Alyssa, Esther. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, Esther is my small group leader. Uh, sorry. What's small group? Oh, it's where we study the Bible outside church. Uh, Alyssa was just telling us about her uh, trip to Australia. Wow. What a missions opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, she's just going there on vacation. I can't wait. Oh, that's amazing. Can I add your trip to my prayer journal? Sure, why not? <laughs> cool. I grew up in MK, so. <laughs> oh, sorry, missionaries, kid. Yeah. Curtis, my brother! Oh, <laughs> with their siblings? Uh, biblically. Hey, my <laughs> sister's in Christ! Hey, Curtis! Uh, Curtis, Alyssa, hey. Alyssa, Curtis. Curtis is in my small group. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi, nice to meet you. Um, I love your Cubs hat. <laughs> Curtis grew up around the stadium. He has some crazy stories. Gosh, that is awesome. I'm sure. I was an alcoholic. Yikes. My identity was wrapped up in, in partying and shallow friendships. What's happening Not right real now? friends. Sharing his testimony. Okay. Bad friends. And, and then I was born again, and my life has never been the same since. So what church do you go to, Elizabeth? Well, nowhere right now. I'm just kind of looking around, but I don't really think I'm like a religious person. Priester. 
it, it's not a religion. It's a, a relationship. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't know. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. you. Pastor Steve, how good and how pleasant it is to have brethren dwell amongst us tonight. Yeah, I was out prayer walking in the city. And then I felt the Lord, he just lifted me up and brought me to be with each of you here tonight. Do we want to order something? I can ask our server. Before we order, I want to invite all of us into a time of popcorn prayer mm. to lift up our server, Rachel. 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 Rachel, and to pray for the meal that we are about to eat. God, Rachel. Yes. Lord, I we pray, pray that she is a vessel for you. Unconditional. Unconditional. Um, we're praying that God chose her to be our server tonight. Yes. Yes. Praise him yes. amid his atonement. Um, we're just, I hope that she's a good night's servant. Justification, Lord, regeneration, yes. sanctification. Yes. 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 Um, we just pray that she gets tipped well tonight. Yes. yes. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, are we ready to order? Yeah. No. I think we're good right now. No, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank God you, bless. Rachel. Thank no, you. So nothing. Okay, Thank cool. You. Thank you, Rachel. Bye, Rachel. So I was walking among the poor of the city today, and I was yeah. grieved in my heart over the losses that they're experiencing. Um, he served the poor this morning, and it was sad. New yeah. mercies every morning. Mm. Um, there's challenges every day. Um, perseverance of the saints. Yes. Um, he lost his wallet. Uh, we may be the only Bible she may read. Oh. 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 Hedge of protection. Hedge of PL. Matthew 6.12, brother. Oh, oh, uh, our, our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily breads and forgive us our sins. Trespasses. Oh, uh, sorry, what? Trespasses. 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 No, trespasses. Trepsasses. No, um, rhymes with the dress. Say yeah. trespasses. 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 Sins. <laughs> Have you guys seen Caleb? Caleb. Caleb. Oh, Caleb. Yeah. Switchfoot. Yeah. Switchfoot. Switch Down with the DC. Oh. Yeah. Down John, with the DC. John, 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 John Tesh. Stephen Curtis. Tesh. Oh, yes. Six pence, none of it. Oh. Jeremy, Jeremy Camp. Technically, uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Webber. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Superstar. Uh, and then the outback. ...of doing the very thing that you see in that video where we speak Christianese all around the lost and they have no idea what we're saying and they have no idea of the hope that we are supposed to hold so very dear. I want to share some things today with you that may shock you, that may even make you mad. And if I make you mad today, then that's okay. I can handle that. The, I'm going to try. The prophet Samuel is sitting there and he is discouraged. He is at a place in his life where he has kind of quit his interaction with what God had called him to do. He is apathetic. He is indifferent. He is cool. He is cold. He has completely stopped everything that God had called him to do. And so God speaks to him and says, how long are you going to mourn over Saul? How long are you going to keep grieving over your past and the decisions that you're not happy with that actually God made and Samuel didn't make. I find it interesting the things in our lives that God allows to happen in our lives often because we don't process them well causes us to disengage the reality of all of our calling as it relates to reaching people. I want to remind you, and it's not on the screen, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 17, the Bible says, that when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There is the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. I think it's quite interesting that Samuel heard from God to anoint Saul. And now that Saul is no longer doing what he thinks he should do and God thinks he should do, Samuel has now disengaged. We have found ourselves as a nation and really in the church during the COVID crisis, withdrawing from one another, withdrawing from the harvest. But I don't think it just was now. I think it was something that's been festering for a long time as 
life happens and we get apathetic. We don't like what happens in life. And so we oftentimes will go through the motions. Sometimes we quit going through the motions because we are frustrated and we are tired. I want to share some things with you today that may shock you. But I'm grateful that God is still speaking. Aren't you glad God still speaks to his people? That he loves you and me enough that he still speaks to us and corrects us and helps us. Now, I want you to think about the generations. And these are the generations that are actually still alive on the earth in some form or fashion. And I want to share some statistics with you that may make you go, oh my goodness, and I hope they do. The, the generation born between 1901 and 1927 is called the greatest generation. And in their generation, 90% of them, according to statistics, 90% of them um, validated themselves as Christians. With 75% of them saying that they would go to weekly worship services together. The next generation, born 1928 to 1945, is what's called the silent generation. And according to statistics, 84% of them claimed to be Christian. And 46% of the 84% said of that generation that they go to church on a regular weekly basis. The baby boomers came along 1946 to 1964 and 76% of them say that they identify as being a Christian, and 34% of those 76% actually go to church on a weekly basis. I don't know if you see what is happening, but do you see the trend? All of it is trending downward. Generation X, which is born 1965 to 1980, 67% of them identify as Christian with 34% of that 67% saying that they go to church on a weekly basis. We move then to what is called the millennial generation born between 1981 and 1995. Statistics show that 49% of that generation identify as Christian and only 35% of them go to church on a weekly basis. Generation Z comes along, born 1996 to 2010, and statistics show that 39% of them identify as being Christian, and only 37% of that 39% say that they go to church on a weekly basis. The next generation, which is known as Generation Alpha, born 2011, going all the way to 2025. I know we haven't gotten there yet, but they say the statistics will be unknown because of the downward trend of not only Christianity, but those that actually value the weekly gathering together of the saints. What is frightening to me about that is that Christianity is now no longer majority in our country. It is now the minority. You are now discriminated against more so now than in any other time because of believing in Jesus Christ. But the thing that bothers me is that we are no longer gripped by the condition of society. The hurting and the broken and, and the destitute and those that were lost and undone without God uh, and Jesus Christ, his son, used to grip the people of God where they would weep at the altar for the broken. But we don't do that anymore because we are self-centered at best. Try it today. Move somebody's cheese. Make somebody upset. And they are absolutely befuddled for life. We forget that one person dies every two seconds in the world. That equates to 1,800 people per hour that die. When's the last time you counted 1,001, 1,002, another person, 1,001, 1,000, another person. When's the last time you considered that 18, next slide please, 1,800 per hour uh, around the world actually are dying right now. But let's kind of zoom in to the United States. According to the statistics in the United States, five people die every 60 
seconds. Now, I know why we're so far removed from it, because if I stood here in silence and for, for 60 seconds and waited for five people in the room to keel over, well, statistically, maybe that's not going to happen, so we get far removed from it. Or 300 people per hour, that means that one-sixth of the world's death takes place in the soil of the United States. And I'm reminded that Jesus made this statement in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. I think along the way, the church, we, the believers in Christ, have forgotten what it was to be lost. Now, we get broken by life, but it's always somebody else's fault. And when we get broken in life, we no longer want to engage the harvest. We don't want to reach out to people because we are self-centered. We don't want to do anything outside of our comfort zone. But Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Do you remember being lost. I remember being the young 12-year-old boy at a Royal Ranger camp out at Newport News Park and somebody, his name is Chris Thornton, shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with a 12-year-old boy and there at the diminishing campfire around a picnic table, the 12-year-old version of William McCarty gave his life to the Lord. I remember what it was to be lost, but I think those that have been found have forgotten what it was to be lost. And the world is dying around us. And statistics are saying that the Christianity in the world is slow fading in the earth. We are becoming, if you will, the minority. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10 verse 2, he says to his disciples, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are what? Few. And then he says this, and we like, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. I know what you're thinking. I'm with you. Let's all pray. Lord, send people into the harvest. And guess what he says? Okay, you go. We go, oh, but God, send somebody into the harvest. Oh, Lord, they're broken and hurting. And we get emotional with the prayer. Would you send somebody to the hurting? He goes, yeah, I, I want you to go. But God, send somebody to the broken and the prostitute and the drug addict and the broke down. God send somebody to the broken. He goes, I want you to go. But what we're really saying is God send somebody else. The Church of America today expects the church to be the agent of evangelism as an organization instead of the body reaching other people. When Jesus said he came to seek and save that which was lost, our mission ought to be the same. But no, today in the church, we like to be entertained. I, I know probably you don't, but, but we love to be, we want a spiritual show. We want somebody to get up and go, woo! Get along, little doggy, and get everybody all riled up. And we want to see people in a mass group of people come to the altar because to be saved so we can sit back and say, look what our church did. But when's the last time that you witnessed to somebody that was broken and took time to reach your hand to someone that was destitute? Listen, People make messes of themselves, and sometimes they've got to figure a way to claw out. But there are still people that have not heard of the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. And you and I are the agents of that. He saved us to be an agent of that salvation. But we don't hear their cries anymore. A matter of fact, if Jesus were to show up on the earth today like he did in those days, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 20, tells us the story that Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Pastor Steve, I can't help but wonder how that would look today if Jesus came along and said, hey, put down those nets Take it up. I want you to follow. I'm going to make you fishers of men. You know what we'd probably be like? We'd say, what? You want me to work? No, 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 no. That's not my calling, Jesus. I am a receiver. 
The prosperity gospel has destroyed the passion of the people of God because everybody, instead of wanting to put the work and effort in to reach the lost, everybody wants to be the receiver. Oh, I receive. I re- what? And they write books about this. Let me tell you how to receive. I still haven't seen the right equation. We just want to receive. We want somebody else to do the work, but we want to reap the benefits. I actually heard somebody say this, a young minister say, I'm not caught. This is... This I actually heard with my ears. I'm not called to build. I'm simply called to build on that which has been built. Hello, lazy. And today the mindset is I want to walk into something that's already built. I just want to glide. I want to coach. Can I tell you that ministry is dirty? Can I tell you that the church that doesn't get their hands dirty and the ministry that doesn't reach into the hidden places and the horrid places and the places that nobody else will go is not being effective? When is the last time you got your hands dirty? When's the last time you walked out and were broken about mankind's condition and you can say, well, it's a church. No, it's on you and it's on me to have a passion. We should and look at young people like they're some kind of a broken burden. We ought to look at young people like they need a savior. His name is Jesus. We ought to look at every generation like they are needing of Jesus. And don't wait till you're perfect to reach out. We are all wounded healers at best. And every one of us need a savior. But we're not broken about the lost anymore. We don't care about the lost anymore or the broken. All we care about. I'm not diminishing your plight and I'm not diminishing where you are. But we sit in church, bah, don't tell me nothing, bah, he didn't sing my song, bah, he didn't preach me happy, bah, he, I didn't get a spiritual experience, I am not responsible for your spiritual experience I am responsible to bring you the word of God rightly divided and here is the problem in the church in America, we are fat happy and lazy and we don't reach the lost anymore and we want somebody else to do the work for us so that we can reap the benefits, no ma'am and no sir, let's get our hands dirty. I don't care what your spiritual manicure looks like. Let's get our hands dirty because Jesus is calling the church to reach the lost. And if you can't see them and you can't hear them, you are deaf and you are blind and you are mute. And God is calling us to do something to the wounded and to the broken. Our eyes have glazed over, our sharpness is dulled, our ears have been deafened to the sound, our eyes no longer see the sights, and our hands have lost the zeal. We've lost it in so many scriptures. We have the, 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 the kingdom of God and Jesus telling us things like Matthew, Mark 16 and 15, where he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody. I, I, hallelujah, preacher. I, I'm not called to be a preacher. Um, bless your heart. Every person, can you say hello, to, say hi to me? No, 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 some of you looked at me like I'd lost my mind or had two heads on my shoulder, so I'm going to do it again. I'm going to look, and please, I will call your name if you don't say hi to me. I'm going to start and look. I, I, try me in this, now say it the pastor, and see if I will not call it forth thy nameth. Hi. 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 I got, I'm going to look at each row. Hi. Hi. Oh boy, he's getting strong. Hi. Hi. Guess what? Hi. You got the gift of evangelism right there. You can communicate. Every single person can come in, but I'm not equipped. Listen to me. It's not about you being equipped in and of yourself. You can pray. The power and spirit of God will fill you and empower you and out of your own brokenness will come a story that the lost can relate to. But you and I for far too long, we just get up and go to church, but we don't consider the number of our days. Isn't it amazing how the days fly by, but I mean the years uh, fly by, but the days just sometimes drag on. And we don't think about it until we're forced to sit at a funeral and consider the life of someone that has gone on to be with the Lord. And then sometimes, for some people, it is too late, but God has called us to reach the lost. Can you hear them anymore? They're sitting there right now. They're cutting themselves. 
They're contemplating suicide. They're drinking themselves into oblivion. They're snorting everything. They're shooting up everything they can get their hands on. That Listen to me, and I know this ain't going to be popular, and it might make some people mad, and dear God, he's going to say it, and we're streaming. we got so many identity crises with people not knowing what gender they are and what anything they are, but dear God, don't let the church say anything about it because then you're insensitive and you're a hater. Listen to me and hear me well. God created them male and female. He created them. Now, that might come across strong. I'm not telling you to go out there in society and be crazy and foolish with your words. I'm telling you we ought to be able to embrace everybody wherever they are and love them where they are. Listen, just because you embrace the lost doesn't mean you embrace what they're doing and condone it. But nobody wants the truth anymore. Everybody gets offended. Have you noticed how offended the generations are today? Ooh. I don't know what I'm going to do. What, what happened? They didn't like my Facebook page. You started crowding people's family again. I'm trying to. But the Bible tells us so many things about considering ourselves. Psalm 90 verse 12, the psalmist David said, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. The New Living Translation says it like this, teach us to realize the brevity of life that we may grow in wisdom. Grow in wisdom how you and I are growing older. Time is passing by. You've got one shot. What about the lost? They got the same shot, only one. And they're looking for people to not walk around with Christian ease, but to walk around with the love of God wrapping them, flow, flowing off of them, exuding from them so that the lost see Jesus in them. But we're so consumed with ourselves today, we can't even see past our own stuff. A lot of Christians today are lazy. I know that probably doesn't apply to you, but outside this room, but if it, you know, if it fits, put on a couple pairs of shoes. And God wants us to engage the harvest. Somebody engaged the harvest for you. Somebody took time to love you to Jesus Christ. They, they spent time on you. The psalmist said in the 39th Psalm, verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end. What is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am? The New Living Translation says, Lord, remind me of how brief my time is on earth. Remind me that my days are numbered and how fleeting my life is. Why do I need to know how fleeting my life is? Because if I know how fleeting mine is, that means yours is also. And the lost is also. But I wonder while we're sitting here today, how many people in the last minute, seconds, have gone on to eternity and nobody got to them? Because we were too busy. We were too wrapped up and caught up in our own frustration and wrapped up in our own self and self-righteousness and self-calls and all those other kind of things. If I know my end, it ought to teach me to know the end of others. Job said this in chapter 8, verse 9. He said, for we were born but yesterday and know nothing. Our days on earth are as fleeting as a shadow. God, help us to realize our days. He wrote in Psalm 78, verse 39, he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. For he remembered, in the New Living Translation, he says, he remembered that they were merely mortal, gone like a breath of wind that never returns. 102nd Psalm, he said, my days are like a shadow that lengthens and I wither away like the grass. New Living Translation says, my life passes as swiftly as the evening shadows and I am withering away like the grass. Every single moment counts and here is Samuel sitting there and the clock is ticking with every moment that he continues to sit there in apathy and disconnect. Guess what's happening? Time is passing by. But David is sitting on the backside of a shepherd's field. You know who David is. The Bible tells us that David is the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. And David is the one who is anointed as king over Israel and had Samuel. I know what we think. Well, pastor, if I don't do that, then God will raise somebody else up. But we don't have that guarantee. If Samuel would have ignored, if Samuel would have just sat there, there's no guarantee that somebody else would have picked up the mantle and gone back to the house of 
of God and filled the horn with oil and went down to Jesse's house. There's no guarantee of that. But when he comes in, David comes in, the Lord says to Samuel like he did with Saul, anoint him, he's the one. And guess what? Today we read in the New Testament that Jesus came out of the tribe and the lineage of David. You listen to me today. The very apathy that is holding you at bay and holding the church at bay, I believe is a design from the enemy to keep you and I from bringing forth the reality of Jesus Christ into our day. Just like the enemy wanted to hold Samuel back at bay, the enemy wants to hold us at bay because there's other people that God is going to call as a result of the church reaching the lost. Listen, it may be a classroom, it may be a street corner, it may be in a car, it may be any in influential place that you find yourself in that God wants to use the people of God but we're not broken over the hurting anymore because we forgot what it was like to be broken even though we are being broken and God is wanting us to remember that the responsibility is on us and we say I'll do it tomorrow the Bible tells us Proverbs 27 and 1 don't boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day will bring We cannot allow the noise of this world and the noise of our own personal plight get us into the comforts of this lazy life or into the complaints of life gone wrong. We have to remember what the Lord said and we've got to take our lives back to the presence of God and be dipped in the oil of his presence so that we are able to reach the broken. And you hear me, I don't care, red, yellow, black, white, they are precious in his sight. I don't care, drug addict, drunked up, cracked up, smoked up, heroined up, cut up. It doesn't matter who they are. I want us to reach the lost. I don't want to be a sheep trading church that we just get people in and out the door that are disgruntled at another church. Listen to me. If all you do is jump ship from church to church, you're going to keep jumping ship and you're going to dwarf your own root system and you're going to stop producing fruit. But I want to reach the lost and the broken. I want to reach the lost and the broken and see them healed not in your name, not in my name, but in the name of Jesus Christ. And that is who we have been called to be. But they don't smell. Yeah, they don't smell like you, but they don't act. But guess what? You one day were offensive to somebody and Jesus saved you. And say to God, do it again in us. Do it again in me. Do it again in us as a body, as individuals that we don't squander every moment. But we don't hear the cries anymore. We're not, we're not broken by it. We'll walk past somebody broken and in tears and we won't even take time to stop because we don't want to be inconvenienced by spending the most precious commodity we have and that's time. Jesus said in Luke 14, verse 23 and following, he's given a parable of coming to the master's supper and he says, the master said to the servant, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come that my house may be filled. Verse 24, for I say to you that none of those men who are invited shall taste my supper. Well. When's the last time you went into the highways and hedges? It's amazing to me. I would ask the question, but I know, what the, I know the response. I know many of us would raise our hand. Yes, pastor, praise the Lord. If we really believe that eternity is long and life is short, why is it? Why is it? And this is not a church growth thing because, I listen, I've stopped worrying about numbers. Trust me, when COVID hit and other transitional moments of life here hit, the numbers of healing waters, all the records that we broke, all of them have been shattered. We're not the numbers we used to be. We're not the financial stuff we used to be. All of it, bam, just got reduced to ash. But here's what I'm telling you. I don't care about those numbers. So what I'm telling you is not numbers-based, nor am I trying to fill seats for the sake of a statistical report. I don't care about those things. But I'm telling you, if we were this serious about eternity, why is it? We're not going to the highways and hedges and compel them. You say, well, I'm not good. Well, you're not good sharing the gospel with somebody. At least care about somebody enough to pick them up and bring them to the house of God where somebody can partner with you and share the gospel with them. But we, we're just tired. We're like Samuel. We're we're spent. And we've lost our edge and we have lost our strength and we are just swinging away in hopes that nobody notices that we can't make a difference because we can't see past our own struggle. And I'm closing with this thought. If Samuel would have sat still, there's no telling what this would have all looked like. 
But what did he do? He got up. He got up. Here's the reality. The decision that, that Samuel made was a decision God told him. There are things in your life that God led you to and led you through that, that didn't work out the way you thought they would work out, and you get all bent out of shape, and you blame everybody. We're, we also got the greatest generations of blame that we've ever had. It's always somebody else's fault. I know not you, but you, maybe you know somebody. You, they're not seated by you. They're not even in the building. They're not even on the live stream. But, but you know somebody. It's always somebody else's fault. Fault, 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 fault. And we're so caught up and consumed. But when's the last time you got your hands dirty? I mean, I think about it from a spiritual standpoint. Where hands are manicured, we, are, we look pretty. Come to the house and go, hallelujah, praise the name. And, and we've got to gather together. We really do. But we've also got to reach outside this place and reach into the trenches because there are people that are drowning in life right now. You see them in the store. You work with them. The sludge of life is just washing over them every, every single day. You're going through the motions. They're going through the motions. They're drowning in life without Christ, and yet you're supposed to be the ones that have the hope of Christ in your life, and they're drowning and you're drowning. And everybody's walking around like this, depressed and discouraged. And we say stuff like this, well, had it not been for COVID, no, COVID just exposed something that was already going on in people, okay? But God wants us more than ever before to be the people of God that exemplify hope, help, and healing to the lost. That embrace them. No matter what they look like, smell like, have come from, it doesn't matter. But I know today you can't, we can't see past our own stuff. And we're hard-headed. Any hard, no, not gonna, how many of you know somebody hard-headed? How many of you are sitting near them? Now that response was bigger than the first one, interestingly enough. I've got to add a little funny to this because this is a serious thing. Every, 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 every moment of every day, people are dying. And here's what I don't want to see. I don't want to see you pick up the paper or turn on the computer screen, social media, and all this other stuff and see the picture in the name of someone that you came across but got too busy to share the gospel with them. And then you sit there for days in horror wondering, did they know? Why are you saying that? Because hell is a real place, ladies and gentlemen. I know people don't like talking about it because, oh, don't say that, you'll offend people. Well, folks, sometimes the truth offends people only because they condition themselves in fantasy land and they don't want to hear the truth. But hell's a real place. And God, through Jesus Christ, came to redeem us. And he wants to redeem through you. The scripture tells us that everyone in the kingdom of God has been given the ministry of reconciliation. I'm just not called to be a pastor or a preacher. Praise the name of the Lord. Because I will tell you, if you're not called to pastoring, it'll kill you. <laughs> That's just being honest. But every person in this room is called to be a light to the lost in this world. I want you to stand with me. Maybe you're here today, and this, in my mind, has gone completely different than how it went in the first service. I thought I was going to ask one question, but I feel nudged to ask another one. You're here today and you say, I want to see the lost, but I am having a hard time seeing past my own self. I get it. I'm having trouble seeing past my own confusion, my own frustration, my own aggravation, my own other tations. Other tations are all the other words that drive you crazy in life. You say, Pastor, I'm, I'm dealing with my own stuff right now and it's hard enough to juggle this. And I really want to see the loss and I want to engage the harvest, but I'm really having a hard time juggling what I've got on my own plate. Can I just see your hand? 
I'm not going to tell you to bow your eyes and close your head. Just, yeah, let me see your hand. That's all right. Yeah, yeah, yep. Anybody lie and should have answered and didn't? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Here's what I want us to do. No one, no one can carry a burden alone. No one. You might think you're strong. You might think you're edumacated. Now, I said that wrong on purpose. I said that for you because I know you'd point it out later. You're welcome. But if you raised your hand, you say, yeah, I'm, I'm carrying a load right now. Here's all I'm asking you to do, if you will. If you said, yeah, I'm carrying a load, I just want you to come and stand in this altar with us just for a minute. I want folks to just join together and pray with you. If you would, just come real quick. I want to pray with you and ask God to help you with your care, what, your care, what you're carrying, and then we're going to move forward. But you, you've got to wait. You say, man, I, it's just pretty crushing right now. Come. Just come and stand. I promise we're not going to crowd you and do all that kind of stuff. You just standing in the space is enough where God can meet you where you are. Would you come and just stand? That's all. Just come and stand. And we're going to pray and ask the Lord to help you. Then as a body, we're going to pray that God will help all of us to see beyond our frustrations and our difficult points and, and all the stuff that just muddy the water. So, Father, I pray for my friends that are here today. Church, pray for them. I pray for them, each one. You know where they are. You know what they carry. You know what they struggle with. You know the things that run through their mind that cause them not to sleep at night, that confuse them on the very issues that you once were easy to decide. And they carry the weight of themselves, their employment, their family both immediate and extended, their ministry, their work, their calling, and the list goes on and on and on of the things that try to press in. But your word says we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. I thank you, Lord, that you give strength to those that look to you. And I pray for this family of God today that you will strengthen everything that is draining them, everything, Lord, in them that's being drained, that you would reinvigorate them and give them a moment to catch their breath. I pray for peace that surpasses their own understanding. I pray, Lord, for wisdom for the next step. I ask you, Lord, that you would undergird them and that out of nowhere that they would see a solution. I pray, Lord, that you would go before them and help them to realize that you always got there first. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to keep their eyes fixed upon you. I pray, Lord, that they would listen to your voice and heed your word. I ask you, Lord, that you would comfort them and give their mind and body rest. And Father, help them to see beyond the storm. I pray you'd reach down to them today and let them feel the comfort of your love and of your presence in this place. But not just here. But when they get in the car or the truck or the SUV or the van or the whatever they drove today, that you would be there when the enemy tries to whisper, it didn't work, it didn't take, it wasn't real. You're still frustrated, you're still flustered, you're still unclear. But Lord, let them hold on by faith these moments that you give. And Father, for this whole congregation, for all of us, help us to see beyond our own storm and see the harvest of souls that are hurting. Lord, whether it's a drug addict, the alcoholic, the ad Lord, we're all addicts to something. We just don't want to admit it. But I pray that you would help us to be better at reaching those that you gave your life for, whether it's in the community, at the workplace, at the store, or wherever it is, that you would help us to be better at reaching those that you came to die for. Lord, I know we've not always done well at it. We've been frustrated. But I'm asking you to help us. And for the lives that are changed and the lives that are saved and the lives that come to know you and the love that only you give, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for everything you do and say through Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us to get the passion for souls back. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pastor Steve.
put a scripture up on the, the board. And we'd like you to pray this together as a benediction. It's uh, Psalms 19 and 14. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your your sight, O Lord, my strength and my my redeemer. redeemer. Amen. Amen.